Well, we welcome you to one. I don't know if you realize this or not, but this is one of 34 different Christmas services that we're having across all of our campuses. Come on, put your hands together. At HPC, we do our best to lift up the name of Jesus. And I know that there are probably a dozen different places that you could be right now. Many of you have schedules this weekend. Thank you for carving out time to include us in your Christmas weekend. How many of you know it's cold outside? What? What do Cajuns do when it gets cold outside? They make a gumbo. Come on, how many's eating gumbo today? Oh, fantastic. Well, the theme, the theme of, of this production and our time together, in case you, you couldn't tell, it's all about Christmas in the city. The, the, I want to take a few moments in the remaining time that we have together to talk to you about this. It's Christmas time in the city. It's Christmas time in the city. How many of you are from a small town? Okay. How many of you are visiting us from out of town? Okay, welcome to the bayou of Baton Rouge. I'm not from Baton Rouge. I'm from a small town in southeast Missouri in a farming community called Fredericktown. Now, you've never heard of Fredericktown. You've never been to Fredericktown. You don't want to go to Fredericktown. In my small community, we had more cows than people. In fact, I'll tell you this, we have more people in this room right now than in the entire population of Fredericktown, Missouri. I grew up in the trailer parks, Route 2, Box B-16. Come on, somebody. You can take the boy out the trailer, but you can't take the trailer out the boy. We were a small town where everybody knew everybody. Does anybody grow up in a community like that? And as a boy, you didn't like that because you... You, you couldn't get in trouble if you wanted to. Between pastors and parents and teachers and coaches, how many has ever been spanked by the next door neighbor? You ever been whipped by your best friend's mom and dad? You know you're living in a good hood when you get spanked by the neighbor. Well, the Christmas story starts in a small town. I read this the other day. I thought this was interesting. Two friends were driving through central Louisiana. Speaking of small towns, Two friends were driving through central Louisiana, and they came across the small town of Natchitoches, Louisiana. As they were driving through Natchitoches, they began to argue over how to pronounce the name of the community. One said, it's Natchitoches. The other said, no, it's Nacogdoches. The other said, you know what? My cousin eats crawfish. It's Natchitoches. The other said, well, you know what? My daddy's brother's uncle's cousin twice removed on my mama's side is a Thibodeau. It's Nacogdoches. Back and forth, they argued, and finally, they pulled over to get something to eat. They walked into the restaurant and walked up to the counter and talked to the guy across the counter and said, listen, can you settle this dispute for us? How do you pronounce the name of this place? He leaned forward, and he said, Burger King. <laughs> I don't know where you're from, but Jesus was from a small town. The Christmas story starts in Bethlehem. I want to give you three. In fact, cities are a theme throughout the scripture. I want to give you three communities that help us tell the story and the journey of Jesus. It starts in Bethlehem. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, and because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. You see, the Christmas story starts in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was an unwalled village, a small bedroom community outside of Jerusalem. At the time of Christ, it had the population of about 100 people. Of all the places in the world that God would show up, he chose Bethlehem. Uh, the prophet Micah had prophesied 700 years before the time of Christ. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, only a small village among all of the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my 
behalf. You see, God had ordained for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. And if you're wanting to take notes, I think this is important to consider. Bethlehem represents new beginnings. New beginnings. I think this is important because, you know, God had spoken to the the people of Israel for centuries through the law of Moses and, and through the prophets of the Old Testament. But when the last prophet of the Old Testament died, there was 400 years of silence between Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. 400 years went by and not a single word from heaven. Until that night in Bethlehem, heaven spoke. God broke his silence, and he says, it's time for a new beginning. You know, we're about to wrap up this year. And though we're reaching the end of a year, some of you sit here today, and you need a new beginning. Sometimes we we start in January with goals and resolutions, and we have all kinds of plans of what this year is going to look like. But how many of you have discovered that life is what happens to you when you have something else planned. Uh, Maybe you're crossing the finish line of this year and you're thinking, I need 2023 to look different than 2022. Well, the hope of the Christmas story, Bethlehem speaks of new beginnings. You know, sin entered the world because man tried to become God. But salvation entered the world when God became man. That's the story of Christmas, love coming down, God wrapping himself up in flesh. The Bible says his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. How many of you know God is with you? That's the good news of Christmas. Now, you may feel lonely, but you're never alone. He's with you. Jesus with you is a big deal. I remember years ago when the kids were small, we'd put all the kids down for bed, and and the the house was dark, and it was quiet. When you reach the end of the day, how many of you, when you go to bed, you just crash? My head hits my pillow. I am exhausted. I remember this night, everything was quiet. I just crawled in bed. Trevor was about three, maybe four years old. His room was upstairs, and I hear, as I pull the covers up, I hear Trevor say, Dad, I didn't answer. I pretended like I didn't hear. You know, if you didn't hear it, you're not responsible for it, right? Come on, parents, don't judge me. Don't judge me. I just think, man, I can wait this kid out. This, no, it'll go away. Dad, Rachel's like, he's calling your name, baby. You got to check on him. So I lay there. I said, what is it, son? He said, Dad. I'm scared. I said, no, you're not, son. Jesus is with you. Good night. (laughs) Then he said, mom. (laughs) How many of you know you can say Jesus is with you, but that night Trevor needed Jesus with some skin. Come on, talk to me. He needed to be able to see somebody, touch somebody, hold somebody. That's what God did 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. He wrapped himself up in flesh. He came to dwell among us. Aren't you thankful that we don't serve a God who just watches from a distance, but he gets involved in our brokenness and in our pain. He says, I'm not going to let you struggle alone. I am with you. Can somebody say amen? amen? You see, God couldn't make himself any bigger to impress us, so he made himself smaller to attract us. Is there anything more endearing than a baby? And Bethlehem starts, that's the first city that tells the story of Christmas. Bethlehem represents new beginnings. That's the start of the story, but it doesn't stop there. The second city I want you to to consider is the city of Jerusalem. The whole story, the narrative of Jesus takes a sharp turn when Jesus enters Jerusalem. Jerusalem represented the the, the center of religious power. I mean, the the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. and, And the power of that day was all in Jerusalem. And Jesus, when he goes to Jerusalem, there's no longer angels and shepherds and wise men bringing gifts. Man, there's no silent night and the cattle that are lowing. Jesus is met with hostility. You see, Bethlehem represents new beginnings, but Jerusalem speaks of the messy middle. Now, all of a sudden, 
the, the, the religious leaders of that day, they are threatened by Jesus. Here he comes with influence and with power. They're jealous of his ministry. Uh, they consider him to be a threat, and so they want to do everything they can to get rid of him. Jesus is met with hostility in Jerusalem. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 12, so also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. You see, if we're going to tell the Christmas story, we can't just stop in that Bethlehem manger. Jesus, he grew up, and then he gave up himself. He suffered and bled on a cross. If Bethlehem is God with us, Jerusalem is God for us. It's Jesus dying on a cross in our Place. The Old Testament says that, that to be outside of the city, you were considered unclean. You were sinful. You had to be removed. It's almost like if you have different trash cans in your house. You have a, a kitchen trash, and you throw certain things away in the kitchen trash, and then you have that outside trash bin where the nasty stuff goes outside. Rachel taught me early on that when you change a dirty diaper, you don't throw it in the kitchen trash. You got to take that thing outside the camp. You see, the religious leaders, they thought Jesus, man, they wanted to rid themselves of the pollution of his doctrine, so they drug him outside the city to be crucified. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us this, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want you to consider this exchange. Jesus became sin so that we could become righteous. Jesus was rejected so that you and I could be accepted. Jesus was despised so that we could be loved. There's an incredible exchange that takes place in Jerusalem. It's the messy middle. Some of you are in the middle of a mess right now. Some of you can't clean up the things that you've messed up. And the Christmas story is a reminder that not only can you have a new beginning, but Jesus is with you in the mess. He doesn't just wash his hands of you. He says, no, I am with you and I am for you. When he died on the cross, he declared, it is finished. The Greek word is tetelestai. It means paid in full. The truth is you and I created a debt in our sinfulness. It's a debt that we couldn't pay. And Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe. And that's the picture of the cross. A mother had three, three boys. Norman, who was eight years old. Jeffrey, who was six years old. And David, who was four. Christmas Eve, she comes across a letter written to Santa. It said this, Dear Santa, Jeffrey's good some of the time. David is good from time to time. But my, oh my, that Norman, he's good all the time. I just thought you'd want to know before the big night. Love, Norman. <laughs> now listen, sometimes you may be a Jeffrey and other times you may be a David, but I promise you this, you are never a Norman. How many of you know we don't always get it right? Jesus knew we wouldn't always get it right, so he came to die. In fact, they kicked him out of Jerusalem. Jesus was kicked out so that you and I could be invited in. The third city that he invites us into is a city called Zion. And this is where the story of Jesus culminates. It starts in Bethlehem. New beginnings. You see the journey in Jerusalem, that messy middle. But there is a promise for our future in Zion. The Bible calls it the new Jerusalem. Scripture tells us in Hebrews, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. I'm telling you, every city on this earth is temporary. I don't care if you live in Brule, if you live in Plaquemine, if you live in Port. Island, if you live in Baton Rouge, if you live in Natchitoches, or if you're from Fredericktown. All of these cities will be gone, but the Bible says there is a city whose builder and maker is the Lord. The scripture says in Revelation chapter 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone with it. And I saw 
the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her groom. And I heard a shout from that throne saying, look, God now lives among his people. He will be their God and they will be his people. And what will he do? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain. All these things will be gone forever. How many of you are looking for that city? A city where joy shall never end, where sorrow has no place. I know that during the holidays, maybe for some of you, this is a difficult time of year. Maybe some of you have said to friends and family members, I just can't wait to get through the holidays. Maybe there's pain that you carry because this is the first Christmas you'll experience without a loved one, a friend, a family member. The Bible says that the city of Zion represents a hope for our future where joy will never end. If Bethlehem is God with us, Jerusalem is God for us, then Zion is God among us. He wants to live and dwell among his people.